when I read this passage, the first thing that strikes me is how often so many Christians fall so short of this. Uh, and that shouldn't be a surprise, really, because we're only human and we fail scripture quite often, I imagine. But I think it's relevant today, given the state of the world, of our conference and even our denomination. More importantly, it's relevant given the state of our entire faith, particularly here in America. I believe that in many ways we are salt that has lost its flavor and that has resulted in much of the world just throwing us out. And I know you might be wondering what could be hopeful about that, but just hang on and we'll get there. So what do I mean when I say that we have lost our taste and have been thrown out by much of the world? What I mean is that so often we continually let people down. We talk so loud and proud about this amazing savior and all the world can see is a group of people who talk a good game, but never really show up to play. We're the critic way back screaming and the nosebleeds about how much the game is being played wrong, yet how often do we go down and play ourselves, right? How often are we getting dirty and rolling up our proverbial sleeves? You see, so much of what we are has been plagued by this adversarial relationship with any who don't believe what we believe. And meanwhile, we don't seem to notice that not only are we not at all inviting and welcoming like we think we are, but even our own amongst us are leaving, tired of our antics. You see, what we need is a mirror. What we need is to be honest about our failings and correct course. We've become so interested in the false hope of power that we are squandering the real power that God has given us to do good in this world. You see, here's the thing. Power is a useful tool. You can control the conversation. You can pass legislation. You can even, in some cases, force your own religious preferences on other people. But you see, if power is what you desire, then you will never have enough power. There will always be more power to be gained. It's nothing more than a drug. There will never be enough for you. You'll spend forever chasing a high that doesn't exist. You see, I believe this is why Jesus never pursued power, even though they called him Messiah, even though they called him King. You see, Jesus never seemed to put too much stock in those titles or roles. Jesus was about the business of salvation, both in heaven and here on earth. You see, Jesus was salt. He lived what he talked, and that's how he was able to bring hope to a broken world. That's how Jesus was the light in the darkness. If he came across people who were sick, he healed them. If he came across people who were hungry, he fed them. If he came across people who were demonic, he cast out the demons. Jesus loved people with his actions and not just his words. Right? And I believe that we could stand to take a page from that book. Because when I look at the world, I see a lot of Christian people that talk a good game. But a lot of us never really bother to follow through. Even if I disagree with the person's views, I can appreciate someone who lives out what they speak or profess to believe. Because if you don't live it, do you really believe it? Or are you just salt that has lost its flavor? A while back, a friend, one who has long left our faith, said to me that she was disappointed that Christians are never the first to do the right thing. She proclaimed that if we believe the things we profess to believe, that we would be on the front lines of justice instead of being amongst the last to adjust as we often are. When are Christians going to be the first ones to proclaim that black lives matter? 
What does it say that we don't stand for those who live on the margins of our world? Not so long ago, the cops cleared uh, the encampment in Powderhorn Park, and I saw a lot of people celebrating that. How many Christians cheered the forced removal of our unhoused neighbors? How can it really be a wonder that people no longer want anything to do with us? Where is our flavor? And when did we decide that we were okay with being useless? I'm not okay with that, and neither should you be. You know, somewhere along the line, we seem to have given up carrying the lamp and decided that it was better to hide it under a bushel. And for what? and the interest of being good citizens, good Americans. Since when did the status quo become good? Because if it's bad for the least of us, then it's just bad. You see, faith and politics and nationalism have become so intertwined for many of us uh, that we can't see that we are actually, in many cases, living against the gospel. The myth of America teaches us to be selfish. We get taught to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps instead of reaching back to help one another across. You know, John Wesley was always weary about the rising middle class of Methodism. Because once we attain a certain stability or level of wealth, it tends to change us. We forget about those who don't live like us. We convince ourselves that we did this, that we earned what we have on our own. But you see, my friends, we have earned nothing. Everything is a gift from God, and if we are lucky enough to have been gifted more than we need, then we have an obligation to give back. Right? We are salt that has lost its flavor because we have continued to confuse Americanism with Christianity. And don't get me wrong, it's more than okay to love America. It's okay to be proud of America. Truly, we are lucky and privileged to have been born here. But loving and celebrating America at the expense of the core tenets of our faith that's blasphemy, idolatry. Many of us, whether we know it or not, are worshiping America. Now, if you're still paying attention, you might be thinking that this doesn't sound very hopeful at all. And that's fair. The things that I've named so far are not where I find hope in the world and in our faith. You see, I find hope in the streets. I find hope in the movements to bring justice to those who have been long denied it. Because justice is God's business. And there was a time where we Methodists made it our business as well. We used to be a people who took pride in shaping the moral conscience of our nation. Now we are known by many as homophobes. The world knows us as the people who want to throw out our queer and trans siblings the same way that they threw out leopards and uh, differently abled in the time of Jesus. But when I see people pour out into the street to proclaim that George Floyd's life matters and that all black lives matter more than some broken windows or a burning city, that is hope to me because it means that some of us are finally getting there. Many of the people in the streets, they don't go to church, but they are doing God's work. And why would they go to church? What has the church done for them? When have so-called so good Christian folks come out into the streets and put their bodies on the line for those on the margins? You know, people, they see everything we do and everything we don't. And that's how they decide who and who not to trust. As a black man, I know the people who will show up for me. And I suspect it's the same for other marginalized people. 
the people in your life that live in different circumstances to you, they already know whether or not you are light to them. It's really just a matter of whether or not you know. You see, Black Lives Matter is a prayer. And if I'm completely honest, on most days it feels like wishful thinking at best. But I have learned that fighting for justice often seems like an insurmountable task. When John Lewis was a young man getting bloodied and beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, I wonder if he knew that he would spend the rest of his life fighting for justice. The truth is being the light and breathing hope into the world is a lifelong battle that will likely outlive us. But it is not your job to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Because the work of justice is righteous in and of itself. And that's how we can be a light to all the nations or even just a light to our very own nation. Now, I know that this sermon is going out to uh, a broader audience across our conference. And I know that some will hear this as liberal or political. Some will undoubtedly tune out when they hear the words justice or Black Lives Matter. But for those of you who are still with me, I want you to understand that it's not too late to breathe hope into the world. It's not too late to be the light. We don't have to accept the world the way it is. We don't have to settle for this status quo. We can steal ourselves for the necessary fight for justice and then go out and do something about it. In the words of the esteemed John Lewis, we can go and make good trouble. And I am always a fan of good trouble. You see, I don't care about the rules. I don't care about the law. I care about justice. And when the rules and the laws are unjust, we have a moral obligation to break them every time. And I will gladly pay whatever consequences come behind that. Because I serve a living God who has never left me stranded. And I have full faith and assurance that God, that God guides our steps. You see, I'm not bold because it's fun. I'm bold because it's necessary. Being the salt of the earth and the light before others is more than just pretty words. To live out the gospel, to live out the gospel, you're going to have to get up out of your pews and put your feet to the pavement. And when I look out into the world and I see the great number of people who have been mobilized by what has happened in the Twin Cities, I say, welcome to the fight. We have been praying for your arrival. Because only when you put skin in the game can you truly know the depths of hope, even when the odds seem utterly hopeless. I have hope that one day Christians across America will be the first to proclaim that black lives matter. I have hope that one day we will be the first to hit the streets in the name of justice and love. I have hope that one day our faith extends beyond the walls of our buildings and takes up the power that we have been gifted to change the world. You see, we don't have to settle for what we are. We can always work to be something better. Living out our faith is a moving target. We can never afford to be still. The goalpost is always moving, and I understand that that is frustrating, but Jesus never promised us an easy ride. I have hope that our salt will soon regain its taste and use again. I have hope that one day we can be hope for the world.
song that hails a new.